Arizona GOP Chair Jeff DeWitt has resigned after an audio recording was released on Tuesday exposing him trying to bribe Carrie Lake to end her current race for U.S. Senate. The Daily Mail obtained the audio recording that allegedly took place in March of 2023 after Lake lost her run for governor and before she officially began her candidacy for the Senate. There are very powerful people that want to keep you out. Oh, no, they do. But they're willing to put their money where their mouth is in a big way. So, this conversation never happened. On the record, on the recording, a DeWitt can be heard asking Lake to pause her race and basically to name her price. Is there a number at which I can be bought? <laughs> That's what it's about. You can take a pause for a couple of years. No. And they go right back to what you're doing. <laughs> no. 10 million, 20 million, 30, no, no, no. A billion, no. This is not about money. This is about our country. In a statement released today, DeWitt said he resigned after getting an ultimatum from the late team. Resign or they would release a recording they called more damaging. I don't know how it could be more damaging than that, but let's uh, talk to an on We're honored to have a former member, a former senator and governor from Kansas, served in the United States ambassador at large for international religious freedom in the Trump administration. Ambassador Sam Brambeck, welcome to Victory News, sir. Happy to join you. Thanks. All right. You ever heard anything like that? I want to get your reaction to the audio recording that allegedly <laughs> reveals Arizona's GOP chair attempting to bribe Carrie Lake to not run for Senate. I haven't heard anything quite that crass or direct in this country. There be people will imply and suggest things, but but to just come right out and say, okay, what's your price? Uh, that's uh, that's disgusting. That's not what the system is about. Uh, you know, parties are important. Republican Party is important. Democrat Party is important. But too often, the party leadership will get involved and say, OK, we need to clean this mess up so that we can win uh, when they really just should have a level playing field. Let everybody compete hard uh, for it and produce the best candidate that they can win in the fall. Right. Let the people decide at that point, because that's what this country is about. We the people. Now, you were the ambassador for religious freedom. You've been an advocate for people worldwide to be allowed to worship and practice their faith. How important is it in the United States to champion this globally? Uh, it's essential. This is the founding right in this country. It's why the pilgrims came here was for religious freedom. It let us become a nation at the outset. And we're the strongest, most vocal, biggest supporter of religious freedom around the world. And it's the most dynamic, moving uh, human rights issue around the world. It is critical that the United States push it and maintain it here at home because we have attacks and challenges on religious freedom here. Uh, but if we start walking away from it or treating it as a secondary issue, uh, It'll decline all over the world. We have to step up and lead on this issue or it's going to go south. Yeah, I agree with you. We, I believe uh, that we take that for granted sometimes. I read a startling figure from Open Doors Research that said more than 82 percent of Christians killed for their faith in the study are from Africa in Nigeria. Why are believers at so much at risk in that country, for example? Hey, you've got such a dynamic faith. You've got a big country largest in Africa population wise. And then you have a pretty equal split between Christianity and Islam and passion on both sides. And I don't know if people are watching this, but really what's setting up right now is a huge war in almost in much of Africa between Islam and Christianity. We've got to get ahead of that and tell people, no, don't fight uh, over the religion. Have the government stand up and protect everybody's right to freedom of religion. That's the way to solve this problem and to deal with it. And it's not being effectively addressed at all by the Nigerian government. Right. Now, while China was supposed to grow in its economy and freedoms, there's actually been new crackdowns against house churches by President Xi Jinping. Your perspective on this? And China's at war with faith. Uh, it's a war they will not win. But they are going after the Buddhists, they're going after the Muslims, they're going after Falun Gong, they're going after the Christians. I mean, this, what they see there as religious freedom is an existential threat to the Chinese Communist Party's control. 
They don't want anything higher in the nation than the government. Uh, they're officially atheists. And yet there's, we're seeing this war, and we're seeing it now go to other countries that support China, like Nicaragua. They just closed down a series of um, Catholic schools and radio stations, kicked out a bunch of uh, Catholic priests and the bishop. Uh, we're now seeing this trend from China taking place in some of its acolyte countries. And it's, uh, it's something that we all need to pray about, we need to be involved with, we need to tell our elected officials uh, to protect religious liberties worldwide, but here as well. Senator, thank you, sir, for being with us today. God bless you and your efforts and what you're doing. No, thank you. God bless you. You know, pro-life causes have had a series of setbacks in statewide ballot initiatives in the past two elections. Most recently, Ohio voted to enshrine a right to access abortion into its state constitution in November. Are you surprised at the aggressive effort the pro-abortion movement has made at the state level? And has the pro-life movement met it head on or not? You know, I think since the 90s, the pro-abortion uh, momentum on uh, in the Democratic Party has has really taken off. They have they have focused more and more on killing unborn children up until the moment of birth. They can't even vote for legislation that protects unborn babies who were attempted to be killed by an abortionist but but survived by a miracle. Uh, they they have just gained steam and so it's not shocking that when the right was given back to the people to be able to protect unborn babies, that, that the Democratic Party has led this charge against unborn children. And, and they've done it with millions and millions of dollars. Um, and and they have really pushed this narrative that, that when unborn babies are protected, women will die. Um, and, and we know that's not just not true. Um, but what the pro-life movement needs to do is, is we need to meet them. Uh, we need to, to take what they're saying and turn it right on them. We need to make them explain what they're actually for. Mm -hmm. Now, Mary, you say there are four ways Republicans should talk about life in 2024. Would you headline them for us? Sure. The first is that we need to describe what we're for. We're for protecting unborn children. We're not trying to ban things. We're not trying. We're not trying to do anything other than protect a human being. And and we need to describe who an abortion tries to kill because it's not just some magic wand that takes a couple back to before a child existed. It takes a person's life. And we have people who have survived abortions. And and the Democrat Party needs to face those people. And we need to talk about moms and we need to talk about how we're assisting moms, how we're working with moms, and how abortion has harmed those moms. And and we can't just talk generally about moms. We need to talk about specific moms, the ones that we know, the ones that we personally have helped. And then finally, we need to make promises we can keep. All right. Mary Zock with the Family Research Council, we appreciate your insight and, letting, and talking to us today.